Good morning. Welcome to the second webinar of the FY23 round of the Community One Stop for Growth. On behalf of the Baker Polito Administration and Housing and Economic Development Secretary Mike Keneally, we want to thank you for joining us today and for your continued interest in supporting and advancing economic growth throughout the state. This is our second webinar of a three part series. A recording of the first webinar, which was an overview of the One Stop in its entirety, is available to view on the One Stop website. The third and final webinar of this series is our technology webinar, which is focused on using the application portal. Webinar three will be posted directly on the website on February 8th. We invite you to submit your questions through the Q&A function on your screen. Questions will be aggregated and responses will be posted in an FAQ document on our website. My name is Ashley Solba. I serve as Undersecretary of Community Development at the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development. With me is Juan Vega, Assistant Secretary for Communities and Programs, and Pat Shannon, our Community One Stop Coordinator. They both do an unbelievable job managing the One Stop on behalf of HED and the administration, and they can be such a great resource to you, as I believe most of you already know. Um, so the purpose of today's webinar is to guide you through the One Stop application and to help you understand where your projects fit within the One Stop development continuum and the application. We'll start with a review of important topics covered in our first webinar and then dive into an explanation of how your projects fit within the development continuum and with a series of example applications based off submissions from last year's very successful round. Finally, we will wrap up with a summary of key takeaways and next steps. So now I will hand it over to Juan Vega. Great, thank you, Ashley. Um, so we'll start by uh, kind of a slide that we had presented in webinar one, which kind of uh, helps us to review the programs that are integrated into the one stop. And as we had mentioned this year, the One Stop includes 12 grant programs uh, across the three organizations, EOHED, DHED, and Mass Development. Uh, at the Executive Office of Housing and Economic Development, we have the MassWorks program, um, as well as the Urban Agenda grant program again. Uh, the Department of Housing and, and Community Development uh, will have the Community Planning grant program and the Rural and Small Town Development Fund, both of which were new and introduced uh, last year. And then they, we will also have the Housing Choice uh, Community Grants and the Mass Downtown Initiative. At Mass Development, we'll continue to have the Brownfields Program, Site Readiness, Underutilized Properties, uh, which was new last year. And adding, uh, being added uh, this time in the FY23 round, we have Collaborative Workspaces, uh, Commonwealth Places, and Real Estate Services. These programs offer a wide range of permissible activities and eligible uh, 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 programming, uh, areas of focus, and funding levels. Uh, the website, as well as the guidelines for each of these programs, uh, can be accessed uh, through the main One Stop website to get details about how each of these programs uh, will be evaluating uh, the applications that are received. The uh, development continuum, again, we want to recall from the webinar one, the development continue, uh, continuum is a critical component of the one stop and a very important um, uh, in understanding the structure of, of the full application. The development continuum represents the life cycle of a major community development project uh, from its initial community visioning uh, to its uh, final construction. Uh, the uh, It's broken up. We break this up into two broad categories. On the left, uh, we have the categories uh, that are related to preparation for growth. And we ask you to think about this uh, as uh, kind of getting yourself ready for a potential uh, large construction project. Um, and these are grants that support activities and initial steps uh, by community-based actors to attract and guide private investment in the community. Preparing for growth includes um, the community capacity building, planning and zoning and site preparation categories. On the right-hand side, we have the categories that are related to catalyzing specific projects. And again, thinking of the life cycle, these are the categories that you would want to apply to when you have, uh, when you're advanced in your permitting, when you're advanced in your design, 
um, when you have a development uh, 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 identified, a private development identified in some cases. Um, and this includes grants to support the implementation of the actual construction activities uh, to leverage the private investment that leads to new commercial, industrial, and residential development or other improvements uh, that further the community's vision. And in this, uh, in this side, we have the uh, buildings and infrastructure categories. And here is where you can see under each of these uh, categories is where you can see the funding activities that are generally associated with each category. And please note that the one stop supports a number of new types of projects in, in this round, uh, which includes uh, business improvement district implementation, placemaking efforts, uh, zoning uh, to comply with the MBTA community section of chapter 40A, creation of a municipal surplus property disposition plan, and, and finally, collaborative workspace feasibility studies and fit out projects. Again, we want to reiterate uh, to kind of the level set here that all types of entity, public entities are welcome and encouraged to submit an application uh, through the one stop. Generally speaking, municipalities and all types of uh, other uh, municipal entities um, or public entities such as redevelopment and housing authorities, um, as well as water sewer districts, et cetera, um, will generally have access to all of the programs that are available through the one-stop process, therefore are eligible in, under all of the categories. Uh, Non-public entities are also invited uh, and are able to participate in the one-stop. We would just note that um, there are uh, some limitations in terms of um, being considered for funding um, in only the certain programs that, that allow for the financial assistance to private entities. And so nonprofit and community development corporations are generally eligible for communities that are funded under the community capacity category, site preparation and buildings. Um, and then for-profit entities, private developers, et cetera, um, would have eligibility under the uh, buildings uh, category only. All applications should include a letter of support from the municipal chief executive officer. Um, and if one is not available, certainly an explanation um, of, of, uh, of letter being forthcoming. We're looking to ensure that the, all these projects, whoever the entity is implementing the project, is in conversations and seeking the support of the local um, of local officials. Again, in this area, we want to um, highlight kind of some very key changes uh, that are that we feel are, are instrumental and um, were major improvements that we tried to make um, to this to this uh, application process. Uh, so we made a significant changes in both the development continue and then within the composition of the full application itself. Uh, with the removal of the pre-development and permitting category um, uh, as a standalone category. And then the redistribu redistribution of questions that were specific to rural and small town development fund and housing choice um, throughout their corresponding um, parts of the application. We found that ambiguity and in some cases redundancy with questions between the pre-development and permitting and other sections caused some confusion and we ended up getting, uh, that resulted in some duplication of grant requests or projects uh, that had uh, selected the, uh, uh, the wrong category. And so we now have pre-development um, is still an eligible activity, uh, but it has, again, as I mentioned, been eliminated as standalone and is now, um, applicants can now request that type of support directly within the corresponding categories of site preparation, buildings, and the infrastructure in the full application. Applicants that are designated as rural, small town, and or housing choice community will again have access to those grants that are only available to, the, to, to those designated communities. However, there will no longer be a separate section for that. The questions uh, for those communities um, will appear uh, uh, specific uh, to, to each application. Uh, they're now built into the actual continuum categories. And so when you arrive at the category, um, you'll, have, you'll have questions specific to your designation and related to the resources that are available to you. We do ask that um, in all cases, please review the NOFA carefully and each individual program guideline that you're interested in applying to. 
um, only eligible applicants that propose budgets within certain funding limits of each program will have the opportunity uh, to participate in those um, particular uh, programs. And then here we want to kind of just highlight again the uh, the development continuum is you know designed to help applicants and reviewers better understand where a particular project fits um, in in terms of a life cycle, um, and and also in realizing of the community's goals, um, whether that be housing, job creation, new industrial spaces, etc. And so, for example, a municipality that owns a site uh, that it would like to redevelop. Um, they know that they will eventually need to extend the public infrastructure when the site is closer to being developed. But they first need to demolish a condemned structure and or make improvements to the site to make it financially feasible and attractive to private developers. And eventually they may be able to apply for infrastructure support. Uh, but in a situation like that, really should be looking at site preparation as the category since they still have a ways to go before. Um, and actual private development uh, can be um, uh, implemented. So applicants should envision their project within this continuum. And uh, most, if not all projects will fit into a specific category based on where you are um, in terms of preparedness. A great resource that we want to offer to help applicants understand where they fall um, is the expression of interest. And we covered the expression of interest a lot in the first webinar. Um, it is optional, uh, but highly recommended form uh, that allows the applicants to essentially uh, describe their project idea and give the one-stop partner agencies from HED, DHED, and Mass Development an opportunity to review that, have a discussion together, and provide written feedback to the applicant about perhaps where it, the project could potentially be strongest in the continuum. The expression of interest is now open through March 18th, and you can submit up to two projects um, through the deadline. And as we have mentioned, um, and is posted on our website, um, Friday, February 4th, uh, is uh, any project, any EOI that is submitted by Friday, February 4th, has the opportunity to uh, submit up to five project ideas. And then here we wanna just uh, highlight the, the full application itself. Uh, it's, you know, it's made up of two main parts. Uh, we have the core question that all applicants, regardless of what category you're coming in on, uh, would need to answer. This includes general information about the applicant, the project itself, the project site description. Um, and then it has the questions about the con development continuum. And these are, um, as you select the, uh, the categories that you're interested in uh, and applying based on this continuum, uh, rather than specific programs, it allows the application then to be reviewed by multiple programs. And so the applicant selects the development continuum category that it wishes to apply, and that will then um, populate the rest of the application and ask the questions related to that category. It's important that applicants do not submit more than one project within a single application. If the projects are in different locations in the community, um, even if they fall within the same category, um, they're separate projects and should be submitted as separate applications. Uh, there is no limit, however, to the number of applications that a single organization can submit, as long as they're eligible. Um, however, applicants should be mindful that uh, similar applications submitted to the same development continuum ultimately compete against each other. So it's important to, um, uh, be confident that you're putting forth more than one strong project, but know that once they're being reviewed, they will be reviewed against each other and against all the other applications in that category. And I love to, I would not, now like to pass this uh, to, uh, uh, to Pat. Thanks, Juan. Um, so now we are going to go through a series of examples of, uh, of projects of vary, varying complexity based off real projects that were submitted to the one stop in the last round uh, to demonstrate how to approach the one stop application. So in this first example, we have a local community partnership proposing a project to implement a multifaceted plan to address the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on black and Latino owned small businesses. Uh, some of you may recognize this as an urban agenda project. Um, in this case, the applicant would start their full application and complete the core sections 
in, in sections one and two. Um, so as Juan mentioned, these are, these are sections that must be completed by, by all applicants, regardless of the type of applicant or the type of project being submitted. Um, as a reminder, applicants that submitted an expression of interest will see that section one is already populated with the information that they provided on their expression of interest form. Section two uh, is for general project information, including the project abstract, progress to date, timeline, anticipated outcomes, and whether the application is being submitted jointly or with other, I'm sorry, being submitted jointly with other entities. The first question of this section asks the applicant to select the continuum category in which they would like to submit their project for grant consideration. In this case, the applicant would select the community capacity building section. The applicant will then complete the community capacity building section of the application, answering uh, questions about the project scope, the target population, expected outcomes, and budget. In the second scenario, a Chamber of Commerce is partnering with a, municip with a municipality to aid local businesses by enhancing public spaces and installing new wayfinding. The applicant seeks funds to purchase new plannings and signage with this, uh, to support this effort. Like the last example, this project uh, belongs in the community capacity building category as it is a placemaking project. Each of the development continu continuum category selections uh, sections of the application ask the applicant to indicate the focus of their project. In this case, the applicant would select pl the placemaking option uh, as their focus. In past years, the applicant would have likely applied directly to Commonwealth Places uh, for grant consideration um, and would only receive a review from that one program. However, now through the One Stop program, such as the Mass Downtown Initiative and Urban Agenda, will have the opportunity to review this project. And there's also potential for additional referrals to programs outside of the one stop that may be able to support the effort. Next up, we have a request from a community to hire a consultant to develop a smart growth plan to explore the impacts of existing and future development within one of its neighborhoods. For this project, the applicant would apply for funding through the planning and zoning continuum category. The main focus of the planning and zoning category is to provide support for early stage projects that require a guiding plan, study, or assessment prior to any construction or site preparation. The intent for these projects is to produce a planning document. I'd like to note that the uh, planning and zoning category is where communities that would like to seek support for zoning code updates related to the new multifamily zoning requirement for MBTA communities uh, should come in to apply for. Sorry about that. I'd now like to dive into an example specific to housing choice communities. Housing choice communities have the added benefit of being eligible for consideration for funding by the Housing Choice Community Grant Program for projects submitted within the planning and zoning and infrastructure categories. In this case, the applicant is requesting funds to update their zoning guidelines to support future transit-oriented development and will apply through the planning and zoning category. In addition to the standard questions in this category, the applicant will be asked whether they have read the guidelines for the Housing Choice Community Grant Program. If they answer yes to this question, they'll be able to access Section 8, Housing Choice General Questions. The process is similar for Housing Choice Communities submitting a project through the infrastructure section. However, these uh, infrastructure, in this case, uh, they will be asked to indicate whether their programs uh, whether the project's budget falls within the program's $250,000 award limit. Um, if the budget does fall within, within the $250,000 limit, uh, the, the applicant will then have the opportunity to complete the housing choice general questions. In the housing choice general questions section, the applicant will answer a series of eligibility questions, as well as additional questions about the community's implementation of housing choice best practices. The applicant must complete the section to be considered for a housing choice community grant program. Next up, we have a community requesting pre-development support to design utility and roadway plans on a former rail yard to attract private investment for the development of a commercial flex space. Because pre-development and permitting is no longer a standalone category on the, on the development continuum, 
Pre-development activities are now embedded within the site preparation, buildings, and infrastructure categories. This project is a great example of site preparation pre-development as the applicant is in the design phase of a project to prepare a specific site for development. Um, when asked for the project focus in the site preparation section, the applicant will see options broken into two categories, site pre-development and implementation. In this case, the applicant would select the civil engineering option under site pre-development. Now we'll look at another example of a site preparation project. Here, a municipality requests funds to aid uh, the remediation of residually contaminated soil on a former auto supply lot that is now owned by the municipality. The goal is for this site to eventually be sold to a private developer to produce new housing units. There's two options for, for Brownfield's projects in the site preparation category. Um, Brownfield's, Brownfield site assessments, which is a pre-development activity, and Brownfield remediation, which is an implementation activity. In this case, the applicant would select the Brownfield's remediation option as the project focus. Applicants are only allowed to choose one option to describe the project focus. In the event that a project requires both Brownfield's assessment and remediation components, the applicant should choose Brownfield's remediation as their focus and can detail the full project needs when describing the project scope. By selecting Brownfield's uh, site assessment or remediation, the applicant will see additional questions populate within the site preparation section that are specific to Brownfield's projects. These questions are required to be considered for funding uh, for these projects. All right, so now we will move into the categories uh, of the continuum that are focused on catalyzing specific projects. In this example, a for-profit developer seeks funding to support the gut rehabilitation of a vacant building in, in a downtown business district to create new residential units. The building has been underutilized for many years with three vacant storefronts at the street level, as well as a vacant second and third floor. Um, you may recognize this as an example of an underutilized properties program project. The applicant here is a for-profit entity and therefore is only eligible to apply within the buildings category for consideration by the underutilized properties and collaborative workspace programs. Like the site prep category, applicants are asked to choose between building pre-development and, uh, and building implementation options when selecting their primary focus. This is, an, this is an important distinction because it will dictate the questions that an applicant sees and is able to answer within the section. Similarly, uh, if an applicant has a project to create a new co-working space, they must select one of the two co-working options as their focus um, in order to gain access to questions required to be considered by the collaborative workspace program. Um, in our next example, we have a, a town that is redeveloping a municipally owned site to support new housing and commercial development. At this point, no developers have been identified for the site. The town seeks funds to support the final design of a new substation and an analysis of the site's access and utility needs to determine how public infrastructure may need to be upgraded to support future development. Um, we can see that there is a development site identified. However, there's no developer. The public infrastructure improvements needed to make the development feasible are still in the design phase. The applicant should seek funds in the infrastructure section as a pre-development project. Pre-development projects in the infrastructure section generally support design and engineering work to prepare for construction for the construction of public infrastructure needed to leverage private development that will ultimately, ultimately lead to new housing uh, and or new jobs. Generally, these projects may not be ready for construction for a few years. When completing the infrastructure section, the applicant should select pre-development design, um, design or engineering documents when asked for the primary emphasis of the infrastructure work. In our next example, a city uh, requests funds for a project that includes the construction of new sidewalks, traffic signal improvements, and street light installation in support of a mixed-use development consisting of office, retail, and affordable housing units that leverages $27 million in private investment. In this case, the project is shovel-ready meaning that most, if not all, of the design and permitting work has been completed and the project will be able to move forward with construction uh, once they receive funds. This is, uh, 
In this case, there's a private developer on board and private investment has already been secured. This is a classic example of a infrastructure implementation project. Um, the infrastructure section is also where eligible communities seeking funds for small town road improvement projects, um, also commonly known as strap projects, should apply. For these projects, public safety and dangerous road conditions will be, will be the priority. Now I'd like to give an example specific to rural and small towns. Communities with rural and small town designation are eligible for consideration by the Rural and Small Town Development Funds for projects submitted in the planning and zoning, site preparation, buildings, and infrastructure categories. Similar to housing choice, rural and small town communities that apply in these sections will be asked if they have read the program guidelines and will then uh, be asked if their project's budget is within the program's $400,000 award limit. If they indicate that the project is within the, the program's funding limits, three additional questions will show at the end of the section that the applicant must answer to be considered for funding by the Rural and Small Town Development Fund. In the example shown here, the applicant has an infrastructure project with a budget of $350,000. They will indicate that their budget is within the $400,000 limit at the beginning of the section and will then complete the rest of the infrastructure questions uh, just like any other applicant would. At the end of the section, they'll answer the three additional rural and small town uh, specific questions. Please bear in mind that if a rural or small town community comes into any of these sections with a, with a project budget, budget greater than $400,000, that's fine. They'll simply answer no uh, when asked if their, if their budget is within the rural and small towns uh, funding limit and will continue on with their application. They'll still be reviewed by the other programs that may be able to fund their project. Um, in our last two scenarios, uh, we'll, look at pro we'll, we'll look at applicants that have multiple projects. First, we have a municipality that would like to redesign a street with new utilities and streetscape improvements to support a new res residential uh, development. The city also wants to create a conceptual design and cost estimate for site improvements on a, city, on a separate city-owned parcel across town to prepare for future private development. This, this scenario is, describes two separate projects, an infrastructure project to support an imminent housing development and a site preparation pre-development project to prepare for future development um, at a completely different location. Um, as, Juan, as Juan mentioned earlier, we require one application uh, per project. In this case, there are two projects requir requiring two separate applications. The first application includes will include the core sections and the infrastructure section, while the second application will include um, the two core sections and the site pre-development section. In our final scenario, um, an applicant requests funds to stabilize a historic structure to make it financially feasible for private redevelopment. They also would like to pursue funds for HVAC and accessibility improvements to allow for residential development in a second building several, several blocks away. Although both projects are candidates for the buildings category, these are two separate projects. The applicant must submit two applications, each with the core, the two core sections completed, as well as the building section. Again, there's no limit on the number of applications that an organization can submit, um, but the applicant should consider prioritizing these projects as they ultimately would compete against each other within the building section. I'm sorry, within the buildings category. Um, so that, that that's all the examples that we have for today. So I'll now hand it back to Juan to wrap up today's presentation. Great, thank you, Pat. So I think uh, at this time, we'd like to kind of just kind of reiterate a little bit uh, the presentation and some of the takeaways. Uh, we want to summarize what you have heard today. The uh, community one stop for growth, as we've mentioned, is intended to boost accessibility of state guidance as well and partnerships and improve the alignment of various uh, funding programs. Uh, and our intent here is to reduce the administrative burden on the communities and to support strategic project planning. Whereas in prior years, applicants may have submitted multiple grant applications associated with a single project. 
um, applicate, applicants to the community one stop just need to apply this once, put forth their entire project, um, and be able to get consideration from the multiple programs all at the same time. Uh, we want to kind of reiterate applicants should select a single funding type in the continuum for each of their project applications that they want to submit. Um, and then submit only one full application per project. Um, the Community One Stop for Growth builds on these opportunities for applicants to consult with the state reviewers um, regarding their project uh, via the expression of interest and the engagement sessions. Um, and we want to, um, uh, again, reiterate the idea that a, a full project equals a full application. Um, and then there are no um, uh, essentially limits to the number of applications that you can uh, uh, provide. Well, now I wanna uh, kind of just cover, well, we do thank you for those that have submitted some questions. We do wanna take the opportunity to talk through some of these. As we've mentioned, the majority of these questions will be aggregated and posted and responses will be posted on our website. But for today's uh, webinar purposes, we do wanna take the chance to kind of address some that we find are most frequently asked or questions that um, uh, apply uh, very broadly. And so one item that we get a lot of question about is certainly um, having a project. If you think your project fits in more than one category, what should you do? And I think generally certainly what we found in the first round last year's, uh, the first round of the uh, one stop and we expect to be the case again. There are very few cases where a project truly falls in multiple categories. For the most part, a full on project can be uh, kind of uh, um, uh, spelled out in one of the categories. And it's important to ensure that you're making the total grant request that you want in that category so that when it's being reviewed, it's being reviewed um, as a whole project. And what we found in a few cases is in an applicant splitting up the cost of the project and trying to submit them on the categories, um, there, you know, that the, the challenge there is that it's possible that one of the programs picks up half of your project in one category, but the other one is unable to. And that doesn't, um, uh, then you have kind of a half funded project. So please be mindful of that. Um, that. I think for the most part, our experience has been that there's very rare cases where you would, a project would actually uh, straddle more than one category. Um, and, if, and if it really does, if it really has two separate components, then it's more likely that it's two separate projects. And in that case, you should submit two separate full applications so that each of them gets the full review um, that they need and a decision can be made on making a grant that would actually support what you're trying to do. Um, the next one we have is I have three projects that I want to submit. How many applications um, can I submit? Is there a limit? And as I just mentioned, um, there is technically no limit to the number of full applications that any one group can um, uh, or any one applicant can submit. Um, and this is especially true if you have um, projects, uh, you know, you might have one infrastructure project and you might have a separate full application for a community planning project, and yet you have a third project that is a site readiness. And those generally will compete within those categories separate from each other. Where we would be, at, at, you know, let you know to be mindful is that you can submit multiple applications in the same category. However, be, you know, keep in mind that those will essentially be competing against each other along with everybody else in that category. Uh, we also get this question about the, I have, you know, I have a pre-development project. Uh, there's been a change. What do I do this year and how do I submit? And as Pat outlined uh, in the various scenarios, um, in the respective sections of site readiness building and, um, and uh, infrastructure, um, there is the opportunity to submit what essentially would be considered a design only or a pre-development only project. Um, and those should be, you should utilize that opportunity when you have a project that's just getting started, you haven't really done due diligence, you haven't, start, you know, you haven't been to your planning board, you haven't started any of the permitting process and you really need to get, and also you haven't done your design and engineering. So 
you know, but you also don't want to miss a whole year of grant cycle um, to wait until you have that ready to come into, let's say, infrastructure. There is the opportunity to submit this year a pre development only project. Um, and that was something that was introduced in the inaugural round and we found to be very successful. And that does not preclude you, however, in the infrastructure or buildings, et cetera, to submit in uh, a full construction project that might include a few, uh, a, a small part of the budget to help you finish a design set, let's say. Or maybe you have your design set and you just need, a, uh, you need some support to get your bid packages ready to put something out to bid. Those kind of costs, which are you know 10% or less of a budget that will just help you wrap up before construction can start, those could be part of a full construction ask. Um, and so we're not, uh, so again, the pre-development side of this, think of it as if you can only do pre-development this year and that's all you're gonna be able to focus and you wanna come into that as a pre-development only project. If you just need a little bit of help to finish up pre-development and are ready for construction in the next construction cycle, then come in um, to the regular construction site. So let's see, we have a lot to, and thank you everybody for submitting questions. We have a, I, I see we have a lot of activity here. So let's see, we're gonna try to answer a few of these uh, and being mindful of time. Uh, let's see, we have, uh, we're limiting, uh, we're limited to only two project ideas for inclusion in the EOI depth. Just checking, can we still submit more than two projects uh, for applications based on the individual agency deadline? So this is an important, thank you for the question. This is an important um, item that we get a lot. It's important to understand that the one, the EOI process is meant to just be an opportunity to have a dialogue, get your project idea, give us a chance to give you some feedback. It does not lock you into anything. You are not compelled based on what you do in this EOI you could submit two projects in that EOI, get some feedback that says maybe the project might not be ready, and then decide to submit two completely different projects in the full app. That's perfectly fine. The EOI is not meant to compel anybody or to say, oh, you only submitted two, that means you can only do two projects in the full app. That is not the case. Please, please, uh, I can't stress this enough. Um, you are you are free to submit as many, even if you don't submit in EOI at all, you can proceed and complete a full app um, if you feel you're ready to do that. Um, so we made the EOI process optional, understanding that folks are at different time uh, lines and, and schedules and um, missing the EOI does not mean you missed the one stop. Um, and conversely, submitting an EOI and getting feedback doesn't mean you have to submit those as projects um, unless you feel that you that you got the feedback, the feedback says this looks like a good project, strong project, and certainly you want to proceed. Um, so I do want to just make that distinction, right? That the one, these are two kind of separate, they're, uh, they're aligned, but they are two separate processes. And um, the whether you submit, if you miss the February 4th deadline, uh, uh, on that Friday, and then you submit the following week and are only able to submit two projects for feedback, you can still submit five full apps just fine. It's just that you won't get that feedback uh, initially um, on, on the project idea. Um, and you can, you know, again, always rely on reading the guidelines for each of the pro programs that will help you understand um, how your project fits. Um, and we do want to note that the full app, uh, the EOI deadline um, is on March 18th. Uh, that's the final opportunity to submit an EOI at all uh, for this round. Uh, let's see, we have another question here. We're rural, small, uh, rural and small town. Uh, do we therefore apply under this program instead of seeking housing choice designation? Uh, because we're rural small town, are we therefore ineligible for housing choice designation? Okay, so I think uh, I would say here there's a couple of different things going on. It's important to note that the housing choice designation process is not part of the one stop. That is a, a process where you submit uh, any required materials directly to DHCD to seek that designation. Um, for purposes of the FY23 one stop, um, and, and, and I would also add this rural and small town is not a, is a designation 
by virtue of your population. Um, and it's already been determined based on the most recently available census data. And you are, you are designated inside of IGX. When you go in there, it'll say whether you're rural, small town, or both. And that's based on population of 7,000 people or less or meeting certain density requirements uh, uh, related to number of people per acre. Uh, or, or, or I apologize, or per square mile. I, I get those uh, mixed up sometimes. Um, so that designation of rural and small town, you already have it if you qualify there. That is what will trigger and give you the ability to see the additional options that are available to you. Housing choice designation, the FY23 application also will indicate at the top if you are a housing choice designated community. That is at the time we open this application, if you were already housing choice, then you have that designation. If you haven't gotten that designation and are looking to seek it later, that will not um, uh, be a determination in, in this full application. Um, and so the, I just want to note that those are two separate processes. Um, and, and no, you would not be, um, um, whether or not you're eligible for housing choice designation is, is, is related to whether you meet the, uh, the guidance or the guidelines set forth by the housing choice program. Um, and that's separate from this uh, full act. Let's see. Um, wonder, let's see if the minister. So if a municipality is submitting multiple projects, is it true that we need to submit the EOI by tomorrow, uh, February 4th? Uh, so again, February 4th is the deadline that we've set um, where the system will let you fill out up to five project ideas. And part of this is to allow the internal working group that's going to review this enough time to get your feedback to you so that it's useful as you move on to the full app. Um, and so, uh, so if you want to submit up to five, yes, tomorrow, February 4th would be the deadline. However, the, we'll still continue accepting EOIs all the way until March 18th. It's just that when you're starting uh, um, the, the, the following week, uh, the system will only let you fill out two of those project ideas. Um, and as I've already stated, just because if you only just because you're only able to submit two in the EOI does not preclude you from submitting full apps for any projects that you feel are eligible in any category. Um, and so let's say we have a question here regarding uh, collaborative workspaces, and I'm wondering, I'll look to Pat um, in terms of any of the, of the examples that you had. Um, the, uh, the question is just looking for an example of how to how to apply for a collaborative workspace and, um, and sure that. sure um, so if you're if you're looking specifically for collaborative workspace um, you will be applying through the buildings category um, so when you'll complete the core sections and then in section two when you're asked um, basically which which continuum category you'd like to apply within you'd select buildings um, and then once you once you start working on the buildings category, there will be uh, the question asking you for your focus. Um, and then there's two options. So the first is uh, under the buildings pre development section, there's a uh, uh, co working uh, feasibility study option. So you can either select that or under the implementation section, uh, there's an option for co work um, fit outs and uh, or the purchase of new equipment, basically building out a co-working space. Um, so depending on where, where your project lies within kind of the pre-dev or implementation um, uh, phases of, of the project, uh, you'll choose one of those two options. Um, when, when you do, if you do select one of those options, uh, it'll kind of manipulate the form a bit um, where you'll see questions that are specific to collaborative workspace uh, projects. Um, and so, I mean, so that happens automatically once you select those sections. So you'll just, uh, continue filling out the rest of the form, um, as normal. Um, and, and that's, re that's really, about it. if you have any other, uh, specific questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to the one, one stop, uh, if you have trouble completing the application. Thank you very much, Pat. I did know that there is a question in here, a technical question. I do want to reiterate that we do have a webinar 
uh, that will be posted on our website on February 8th to talk through um, the uh, specifics about accessing IGX. There's a question about somebody waiting for uh, uh, the organization to be approved in IGX. Please send an email to onestop at mass.gov with specific questions like that. And thank you. I now want to just pass it on uh, to Ashley. Juan and Pat, um, and thank you all to you for joining us today. We are so excited about the One Stop. We love collaborating with you, um, and we love helping you to achieve your economic development goals. Um, as it's been said a few times, we'll be posting recording of our webinars to the One Stop website, um, along with answers to all of your thoughtful questions that I see are, are coming in. Um, and we'll be posting our third and final webinar um, to the website on February 8th, as Juan mentioned. Um, also on our website are the NOFA guidelines. We invite you to review them. And of course, please submit an expression of interest. I know many of you have opened your EOI already, um, but I will just remind you that the earlier you, earlier you submit your EOI, the sooner we can get our feedback back to you um, in our efforts to be as helpful as we possibly can. Um, so as Juan said, please visit mass.gov forward slash one stop for more information and contact one stop at mass.gov with any questions. As many of you already know, our team works really, really hard to be as helpful and responsive as we possibly can. So please do not ever hesitate to reach out to us with any questions. So thank you. And we look forward to working with you all again for a great FY23 one stop round. <laughs>